In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to everybody. A uh, special welcome to uh, those who are attending the uh, Life in the Spirit seminar uh, beginning this uh, right after Mass today. Um, for those who are newer uh, to the Latin Mass, I want to do a brief intro, and then I want to say something about today's feast. <clears throat> so when you come into the Latin Mass, in most places, in this place, normally, unless the p printer breaks, um, you can get uh, two things. Uh, the first uh, is called the Red Book, for obvious reasons, and the second is called a Proper Sheet. So in the Red Book it are what's called the Ordinary of the Mass, uh, and the easy way to remember that is uh, what is ordinarily said or done at Mass is in the Red Book. Uh, and so most of what happens at Mass, whether it's the Latin Mass or the Novus Ordo it is, it's a ritual, so it's, you can, ex, you know what to expect. Uh, that the same parts happen over and over again. And so the way that the Red Book is organized uh, is that on the left side is uh, the Latin texts that the priest is saying um, or that the cantor is singing. Uh, and on the right side are the translations. Uh, and um, and so it's always you always have the English available to you. Your vernacular is is uh, available to you at all the masses, and um, the rubrics, kind of what's about to happen, uh, what the priest is supposed to do, uh, or what the uh, is is in the italics, uh, and then an explanation of what's happening uh, is on in the margin of the right page where the vernacular is. So one of the ways that you can participate at, at, at a Holy Mass, at a Latin Mass, is uh, just to keep following along. It, when you follow along with the, the Red Book, it can feel like, um, it can feel a little bit like rush hour traffic. It feels a little bit like tr driving down the lodge, um, where um, like, like everything's going like faster than the speed limit, right? So you're just, and then all of a sudden you have to slam on your brakes. And then you're just going to, like, stop there for a while. And um, uh, so that's kind of how this works, where um, at, at first you're kind of like, all right, well, what's the priest doing? Okay. Um, oh, I think I found out where he is. Oh, yeah, I definitely know because the cantor's singing this. And then, oh, man, well, now, we're, now we're, we're going real fast. And then, boom, you get to essentially, you know, waiting for the gospel to be read, and it's a total dead stop, and that's Okay. Um, the dead stops are there for you to catch up, to, ca to, to catch your breath, um, to pray. Um, so, um, so that's, and, and so the whole Mass is here. It's helpful to remember that the general outline um, of, of the extraordinary form is the basis of the, the outline for the Novus Ordo Mass. Um, so you're used to the Mass being in two parts, we say, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. It's the same idea. Uh, it, that idea is coming from the extraordinary form that has the liturgy of the catechumens that goes up to the preparation of the altar. Um, of course, uh, okay, so that's the ordinary, the proper sheet. This is the stuff that changes. Um, all of these things are also in the Novus Ordo. We just tend to pay a lot less attention to them. Um, so what's called the intro it, uh, in the Novus Ordo, we tend to call it the entrance antiphon. Uh, it's still called the intro it, but when we translate it, we call it the entrance antiphon. Um, the entrance antiphon is a proper part of even the Novus Ordo, but it's normally left out. It really shouldn't be. It should at least be read silently by the priest if it's not sung by the cantor or by the congregation. Follow the intro it, uh, which is uh, also called the entrance antiphon, um, then we have uh, the normal beginning prayers. Now, in the, in the extraordinary form, it's, um, it's not as um, involved of a dialogue with the people, but it's a, more of a dialogue with God. Um, so the priest, on behalf of the people, along with the people, are in dialogue with God. Remember, Mass is particularly prayer. It's about coming to worship Christ and worshiping the Father the way that Christ showed us to do it, the way the Father wants to be um, so there's limited interaction between priests and people because we're all going to God. So um, the big moment that you know that the collect is coming 
is that for the first time, the priest turns around to you and he says, Dominus Vobiscum. If you go to three Latin masses, you're going to be really comfortable with the, the little parts. You're going to just, it's just going to be like, just like if I say the Lord be with you, you're going to say, and with your spirit. And, um, and if, if you haven't been to church for a while, right, and you only go to, like, funerals or something, if I say, the Lord be with you, you're going to say, and also with you, right? And um, so, right, we, we get it in us, like, really, really deeply. So, Dominus Fubiscum, et cum spiritu tuo, which is the, uh, a, a literal translation of that is, and with your spirit. Um, of course, when the priest is saying that, it's not the priest saying that. It's Christ saying that, right? Um, and, um, and if a bishop presides, he says, peace be with you, right? And that's that, what does that remind you of? Jesus in the upper room right after the resurrection, and he comes and he says, gives you peace, right? <clears throat> anyway, so the collect then, the point is, is to collect, is the way to remember it, all the prayers of your week, of your month, of your morning, of whatever, to bring them all together, and then um, what's going to happen is the church is picking them all up. And uh, what she does then is she lays them in the person of the priest at the altar of God in the words of today's feast or celebration. Uh, so, we're, so, um, so we just saw that, right? So after we prayed for mercy and after we uh, glorified the incarnation by singing the glory to God in the highest, then we go into this collect, and, and, uh, which is gathered by the feast. Okay. Then we have the readings. You might say, well, why is even the readings, why are they facing God? You know, in, uh, in, in St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, he says that we should offer ourselves um, as a reasonable service, a, a, a logos latria, that is, a worship of the word to God. And so the church has always understood that the way we worship God is not by how we feel or by what we want to do. But the way we worship God is by giving back to God the thing that he gave to us. And before Christ ever instituted the Eucharist, the word of God came to God's people um, through, uh, through the patriarchs and prophets. And so the first thing we're doing is we're acknowledging the great importance of these words and we're offering them back to God. Yes, it's for our, also for our instruction, but it's not solely for our instruction. And at Mass, it's not primarily for our instruction. Divine revelation is we have received something from God to give it back to Him. Uh, and so that's why, um, that's why Brother, whenever he sang the epistle, he sang it uh, towards the altar, because the altar is the place of worship. And also that's why I sing... Um, now, the Gospel's a little bit different, actually. Uh, because I'm at the altar, but I'm kind of facing off of it. So I'm facing liturgical north. This is coming from a scripture um, from Isaiah. It says, proclaim the good news uh, to, uh, to the barbarians. And uh, which uh, it's commonly known that they were in the north. <laughs> the barbarians were in the north, right? So it's using symbols as the idea. That if the north is the place of unbelief, then the priest is proclaiming the gospel to the north. Um, which is to the people who haven't heard. And in some sense, we're all the people who haven't totally heard the Word of God, right? But it's also to other people. So it's a very strong evangelistic element of the Old Mass. The Offertory and the Secret are, are two prayers that are prayed quietly, but when they are prayed, um, you are able to, um, uh, to, to read along. Then there's the preface here, uh, which happens also in the Novus Ordo. It's the way that we, be, we are preparing ourselves to go in to the Eucharistic prayer, which is the most important thing any of us ever do, ever. The Eucharistic prayer, the, the reception of Holy Communion. Well, that whole prayer leading up to the confection of the Eucharist and then us receiving communion. That prayer, it, it, it should be like the prayer of your whole life. It's so super important. But the, the, old, the, the extraordinary form, the Old Mass, um, has two ideas about what to do with the most important things. That if it's super important, then it's either whispered or it's sung. Well, the Roman canon or the Eucharistic prayer is so important that it's always whispered. Um, and so um, to know what's being said, well, you have to do a little bit of work. You have to follow along in your red book. Um, it's actually really advantageous to 
um, read um, ahead of time these prayers before Mass. It's a good way to prepare yourself for Holy Mass. Um, and then uh, beca- and allow them the silence to just really, really capture you. Um, the, the thing I love about, one of the things I love about the Old Mass is how free I am to just, like, think my thoughts and feel my feelings. Like, I, I'm not, there's not um, just a bunch of words coming at me all the time that are kind of telling me, I can, I could, I could, I could follow along in, uh, on the proper sheet. I could follow along in the ordinary, or I could just be here. And all of those things are very, very acceptable. Um, the one last little note is that Holy Communion is, uh, is only received in the extraordinary form on your knees and in the tongue. This has been the way that it's been done uh, for 1,800 years in, in the Catholic Church. Um, and even in the, in the, um, as like an absolute, like, figured out this is what we do. Um, There have been few exceptions, but the exception has never looked like it looks now, where somebody comes up standing and and, and says anything and puts their hand down. Um, There are occasions where reception in the hand happened, but they they did not look like this. Um, Actually, uh, what what actually would have happened if if in the places that communion was received on the hand is that communion was placed on the palm and then the person receiving communion didn't lift their palm but they received the communion from their palm to, as a sign of reverence and respect that you go down you have to humble yourself to receive the holy communion um that's how it's that's the way it's done in in, in the in the west so um the the standard formula is to come and kneel um in adoration and you kneel side by side. Of course, we'll do some social distancing, so we have to spread out a little bit. Um, but the, the beauty I find in the kneeling is that you can just be in, an, in a posture of worship and in a posture of, of waiting, of, of, expect, of, of anticipation, um, instead of just kind of having to pay attention to who's in front of you and walk forward. I don't know if you've ever had like a really deep, you know, prayer time at like a Novus Ordo Mass. I have, especially at the Our Father, where I can just close my eyes and I would just say the Our Father, and then all those prayers would wash over me, and then it gets all quiet for a little while, and I'd really start to pray deep, and I'm like, oh my gosh, now it's my time to go for communion. Then I start going up for communion, and I'd still want to just be there with like my eyes closed, but like I couldn't because I had to like keep pace, and, um, I, and uh, so anyway, you could come just to the altar rail. Um, and you can, and you wait, and you wait for the Holy Communion to come to you, and you can pray, and you can worship, and you're already in a posture of worship. And um, and then the priest says to you, "May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring you to everlasting life." Um, and then he says, "Amen." The prayer is prayed over you, and then you receive Holy Communion. Um, you don't have to say anything. You're just, uh, you know, the way I like to say it is, you're like a baby bird, right? You're just being fed by Mother Church. And so all you can do is just lift, tilt your head back, close your eyes, and place your tongue out. It, it is a vulnerable kind of a thing to do, but it's very, very beautiful, and it's something that you can very much get used to. Um, and um, so, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the one other thing that I would say about my first time going to a Latin Mass is I felt like it was never going to end. Because um, right where it was like good, normally ends, which is like, may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You're going to see me do that. Benedict Avos, Omnipotus Deus, Father, Filius, Spiritus Santus. That's going to happen. And um, you're going to be like, okay, it's over. But it's actually going to be like three more minutes at least because I have to read the, the St. John's Gospel. And, and every, at every Mass, you say St. John's Gospel, the, the, the prologue of John's Gospel. And the reason of saying uh, the prologue of John's gospel is that's where John says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, um, and the word at every holy mass becomes flesh, and then you receive the flesh of the Son of God. And now he dwells in you the way he dwelt in the, in the, in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we have to remind ourselves every Holy Mass that this is what's happening. And that's why we read uh, John, the, John's Gospel. Uh, so in other words, the Old Mass has built into it preparatory prayers and following prayers that we all just do together. And then you can do, of course, more preparatory before and more Thanksgiving after. Um, in other words, the Novus Ordo is a slimmed-down ritual. 
The emphasis in the Novus Ordo tends to be words, not symbols. The emphasis in the extraordinary form is symbols. Um, but then uh, the words are beautiful, and there's a ton of scripture, and it's wonderful. I hope that's helpful for people who have been going to the Latin Mass, who haven't been, or if this is your first one. Um, my recommendation is, like, just throw this out, right? Like, like we're, we're t- so, I think we're trained by the new Mass to have to follow every single thing, and you don't. You just have to come and worship God. You just have to come with a worship and let the music flow over you and let the symbols kind of happen and know that you're in a holy place and that this is the gate of heaven today. That's my advice. That's what I did when I first came to this stuff. And also whenever I would go to the liturgy of John Chrysostom and St. Basil, which is what the East does. Um, and, uh, and you can just receive it and you can pray. Okay.